we'll move on to our next session, which is kind of linked because we are going to have leaders in our um, device manufacturing field come and speak to us about uh, all the exciting stuff that is happening with their respective companies. Uh, three major important players are here today with us uh, from Medtronic. It's Dr. Nagesh Upaluri, who is the Senior Director of Global Medical Affairs. From Microvention, it's Dr. Jacques Dion. For Penumbra, it's Dr. Geeta Berry. Uh, she is the VP of Global Marketing. So please welcome all our guest speakers. Um, give a hand. This is a, a very special moment for us. Uh, we started this industry roundtable maybe three or four years ago as uh, Dr. Valab Janardan's initiative, and it's a, a special moment to interact with our industry leaders who've sponsored much of our meetings over the last decade. So we really want to honor and thank them and, and pick their brain a bit because they're very special people who have lots of interesting ideas. Sure. Um, so we were thinking, uh, and this is an open forum, so I wanted this to be as interactive as possible. So please get your questions ready, ask questions, be interactive. But I was thinking maybe the best way is for the guests to take five minutes and introduce themselves personally and introduce their companies. Because uh, when it comes to some of the bigger companies, for example, Medtronic, uh, you know, I'm just using that as an example. You have like the link device, you have the stent retriever, you have um, the pacemaker and anything else that you can think of. So there's a different rep for everything. There's a different person that you need to contact for everything, every different part. And I'm sure we go through this every day. We also have many questions for them, so please listen to their introductions, formulate uh, what you would like to know. Uh, we have some questions that we have written out, and we'd like uh, the companies to focus on those. Um, so we'll start with a five-minute uh, timed introduction from, let's start from our left side. Uh, let's start with uh, Geeta. So first comes to first, I will clarify that I'm not a physician, and I have great respect for those who are, so thank you all for that, um, and for that it's a wonderful accolade, but not me. Um, I am Gita Berry. I am the Global Vice President of Marketing for Penumbra. Um, I've been with Penumbra for just almost four years, um, but Penumbra is near and dear to my heart, as most of you know in this room, as um, it's been part of my family, actually, for a really long time. And, um, oh, of course, thank you, sorry. Um, Penumbra is committed to stroke, right? Penumbra started as a stroke company. I think many of us think of Penumbra as a stroke company as we started with Aspiration in 2004. Um, Penumbra has continued and committed, remained committed to stroke um, for from now until the last 15 years, and we've continued to innovate. We've continued to drive ourselves towards our commitment of patient care, um, and that has really been focused entirely on Aspiration. Um, our company has grown though, right? Our company has expanded. Certainly, we started with access devices, we have embolization devices, but we also now have a whole portfolio that addresses the body, and we're now just entering the space of stroke rehab um, and, we, and moving into the world of using virtual reality to be able to help patients. And so we don't think of ourselves necessarily as a stroke company at this stage. We think about ourselves as a healthcare company committed to patients. Um, and certainly stroke is in our heart, in our minds, and this is where we will continue to, to innovate. Um, and that's where you see us expanding well beyond just devices into this new world of rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nagesh Upaluri. Uh, I lead our medical affairs function for uh, Medtronic Neurovascular Division. The, um, as, as most of you know, we uh, went through a series of growth and acquisitions in the neurovascular space. We started as MTI and then became EV3 and then Covidian and then Medtronic, and uh, which also kind of signifies Take us the, through that a little bit. Uh, so, I think a lot of people still 
I get confused with that. Can you take us through how it happened? Uh, just a little bit more detail on that? Sure, absolutely. So um, MTI was about 10 or 12 years ago when you know we were primarily a coils and an onyx company and you know a little shop out of uh, outside of, in California. Um, and as we started, you know, um, our journey, we, you know, got acquired by a company called EV3, which was into endovascular procedures. And we had both then the neurovascular and peripheral vascular portfolio. Um, but we, you know, our leadership at that point very quickly noticed that the neurovascular segment was really going through a phenomenal growth phase with, you know, endovascular procedures becoming more and more prominent. And so, um, and truly became the growth engine of that. And during, you know, about 2011, uh, 11, 12, 11, uh, 12 timeframe, that caught the attention of Covidian, which was a pretty large medical device company with a pretty extensive portfolio, endovascular, surgical, and so on. And uh, we got acquired primarily because of the growth that they were, that we were seeing in the neurovascular space. And then four years later, um, you know, Covidian uh, caught Medtronic's attention, and it was a perfect uh, merger of two really big, innovative medical device companies. And so today, with that acquisition that happened five years ago, that merger, uh, Medtronic stands as the largest med standalone medical device company in the world. Uh, we have over 130,000 employees uh, across 150. Our products are available across 150 nations and countries and so on. Our portfolio is very extensive with a substantial investment in R&D. As you can imagine, for medical device companies, innovation and, and, and technological advancement is truly the growth driver and the growth engine. And so, uh, you know, we have an extremely healthy investment into the R&D also. Now, as the, the advantage of being, you know, part of a, a, a big company like this is truly the uh, synergies that exist between uh, overlapping technologies. And like you had mentioned earlier, Jawad, the, uh, you know, that marriage of the link device and, you know, the, um, the technologies we have for ischemic stroke care, that complementarity really could happen because we were part of a larger organization as Medtronic. And, you know, that essentially sets the tone of how we see uh, stroke care evolving and what our role is. So in addition to leading the technological innovation and bringing you know, improved and better devices to the market. We believe that, you know, a, 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 as a, we have a responsibility as a company and as a manufacturer to cover that entire spectrum of stroke care, you know, right from patient workflow uh, and identification of LVO all the way to discharge and rehabilitation. Um, you know, you, and you see that in terms of some of the partnerships that we have forged. You'll hear a lot more about Viz AI and the data that they, had, they have been showing. We have a partnership with Viz AI to improve early detection of LVOs and save time in terms of transport of patients to the hospital. Um, and, you know, obviously we take a lot of pride in being, uh, you know, driving the uh, data that made stent trevers as a first line therapy and an intervention, um, you know, for, uh, for acute ischemic stroke with all the uh, studies that we had supported and conducted. So, the evolution in this space has been, uh, you know, it, I, I think we are just getting started with, the, uh, with some of the automation and the robotics and the AI uh, work that we see. Uh, the future is going to be just so bright here. I think we are just at that, you know, right now in that log phase, if you will, where, you know, uh, everything is taking off. And, uh, and, and Dilip, I, I, I want to call out the uh, work that has happened on MT2020. Um, you know, and, and, you know, really kudos to you. You've been a driving force behind MT2020 and championed that all the way through. We believe it is truly, uh, um, you know, projects like that that are going to open market access in developing countries where they have a lot of challenges. So thank you for that. So. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Jacques Dion. Uh, I am Vice President of Medical uh, Scientific Affairs uh, for my convention. Uh, I have occupied that position for two and a half years, so I'm a bit of a newbie in the company and in this field. Uh, prior to that, I'd been in practice for 35 years in interventional neuroradiology, and the last 20 were spent here in the backyard of the hotel here, just down the road at Emory. Um, 
My title is sort of vague, and essentially what I do with microvention is I act as a bridge for anything uh, that might be useful uh, to join practice of endovascular uh, neurosurgery, interventional neuroradiology, whatever we call it, with uh, the needs of a company. And that being said, um, Microvention is a relatively young company uh, founded in 1998. Uh, at the time, the initial intent was uh, to form a company on a clot retrieval device. Uh, that was uh, thought to be maybe a little too early at the time for survival of a startup company. So the focus was uh, changed to hemorrhagic uh, treatment uh, and essentially I think Microvention made its name uh, on development of uh, coils and in particular uh, the hydrogel coil. As the company grew and uh, was uh, acquired by uh, Terumo in 2006, uh, we were able to leverage um, both our internal uh, abilities to develop uh, products uh, and materials, uh, devices, along with uh, some of the technologies uh, that, that were made available to us from Trumo. Uh, we, for the first 80 percent of those uh, years that uh, Microvention has existed, has uh, essentially had a major focus on hemorrhagic treatment. And uh, later on, uh, a few years ago, with the development of some aspiration catheters, the Sophie in particular, uh, and the Eric uh, thrombectomy device uh, that is available in Europe, uh, we became more and more gradually involved with ischemic stroke. At this point in time, uh, we have uh, a strong intent to uh, continue uh, our foray into the uh, ischemic uh, stroke treatment, uh, along with uh, the other companies uh, that are present on the podium and the ones that are not present as well. Thank you. All right. Um, pl please use your devices to ask questions. I'll have uh, Dr. Noyan lead the questions uh, for the industry. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful introductions. I uh, just wanted to continue the conversation that uh, Philippe has been leading with the MT2020 Global Access to Thrombectomy. How do we reduce the gaps to access of care? How do we dismantle the barriers to getting thrombectomy in developing countries where there potentially is a, is a big problem with uh, getting the devices and the care needed. So, you know, Gita and Dr. Ipluri, you're both very well-traveled um, in the global affairs of your companies. Can you give us a little bit of commentary on how you see you know, which countries are you know, growing astronomically, which countries have potential, and what barriers you see for growth of uh, thrombectomy worldwide? And you can choose any part of those questions. Well, I, I think we see tremendous growth still around the world, right? And I think that's where it's a hard question to answer. And Dalip and I have had this conversation actually many times, right? And I think Jacques, you and I have had that conversation somewhere along the way as well, right? Um, certainly, if you think about developing countries, so many countries are developing. When you think about, even in the United States, the number of potential addressable mechanical thrombectomies, uh, gentlemen, would you say roughly 200,000? Right in the yeah. United States, if we if we had reached our full potential and we're at roughly 45,000, 45, maybe 50,000, um, we still have a long way to go. Um, and so, developing countries have even further to go. We see outside the United States, the penetration is even less. Right, if we're about 20% penetrated in the United States, we're probably less than 5% penetrated around the world. Um, Europe has a long way to go, and we don't think of that as being a developing country. I think we could all have a long debate about the UK. Um, and everything that's happening in the UK um, as it relates to stroke treatment as we're just starting to see 24-7 centers pop up in London, of all places, um, where you would expect to see high level of stroke care. Um, but then you have countries like China and you have Russia and you have Brazil um, that all have interesting challenges ahead of them. Um, we see tremendous growth, I would say, all around the world um, and opportunities, um, but everyone has more way to go. Um, gentlemen, what do you think? So, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. But um, just to continue the last point that you had made, Gita, 
You know, China really stands out as an outlier in terms of developing countries that are doing a lot of, you know, that are making tangible progress when it comes to ischemic stroke care. Mm -hmm. the, they have, you know, kind of organized within the country itself between uh, interventional neurology, uh, neurosurgery, and, and neuroradiology, and truly are, you know, uh, leading the way in terms of how you continue training and developing new talent and interventionalists. So a lot of the new, newly you know, uh, trained interventionalists are coming from the neurology background. They're interventional neurologists. Um, now to a point where there are you know, a few hundreds of centers in all over China that are capable of doing stroke care. They have organized themselves in uh, being able to identify centers uh, along the coast where you, know, you have neurologists from mainland China who are able to go get trained and then go back and, and do intervention in their facility. In, um, in, in one of the hospitals, in the Xianbu Hospital in Beijing, they even have an advanced method of, uh, or mechanism of remote proctoring, mm -hmm. where when their fellows come and train with them and go back to their hospital, they go home with a kit of cameras and internet equipment. So when there is a stroke call that comes in this remote facility 2,000 kilometers away, there is a physician in Beijing who is alerted to it and is, and is by a computer and is watching the case and giving directions, continued directions. I think there is a lot to learn from China in that regard for the you know, other developing countries too. And, and to your question, Dr. Wen, you had asked about some of the barriers that exist. It truly comes down to, I think, uh, healthcare so awareness, both public and government awareness. I think MT2020 is going to pay, play a pivotal role there. Um, healthcare policy changes, and I think that is a public and a private, uh, uh, you know, uh, partnership of institutions partnering in these uh, different countries. And for developing countries specifically, it is about affordability. The economics plays a very huge role. And I think there is, again, a partnership between both the manufacturers of the technology, uh, the policy-making bodies, and the government in these regions to truly find, you know, a more affordable solution because, uh, you know, there is huge volumes and the p potential is very large there. But I think those three stand out as the main barriers. John? Well, the two prior speakers sort of took the words out of my mouth. Um, I, I agree fully that China, um, although a developing country, is, is really exploding. Um, and they they were really getting themselves very, very well organized. Um, in other less fortunate parts of the world, I think there is issues that relate to infrastructure, road infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, lack of government involvement at this point, which needs to occur for this to move uh, forward. Um, and that goes along with affordability um, I think it was in Naples uh, where um, one of our physicians from the World Federation um, of Therapeutic and Interventional Neuroradiology was de describing a situation that was, to me, it was, it was, it was very sad and, and alarming, where there was a discussion having uh, been during the, the, the session where we were discussing, well, we got nothing to lose. And, and we heard that this morning. You know, take a patient, got nothing to lose. Well, in the case of a developing country where uh, some of these families or patients have to pay up front for the catheters and the, all the tools that we use for this, if the patient does not improve, um, that's a big deal for the family. So there's some economic issues that are different and uh, you sort of have to look at the problem in a different way, I think, in some of these economic countries where uh, families and patients have to bear the price of this unless the governments get, in, get involved. So, um, and there's other issues with sometimes uh, corruption at the governmental level uh, that can play uh, into this. Um, so I, I agree with the comments that were made uh, by my two colleagues, but also um, to reinforce the fact that I think at all levels of, the, of these countries, I think government and systems of care have to be uh, active and implemented. 
I just want to um, make a point about what uh, Nagesh said about China. So this is, is really um, a, a very important uh, example, as you pointed out, because while we um, logically can come up with uh, interventions, to see uh, an example where the acceleration has been so quick uh, is really very, um, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it teaches us a lot. And, and would you say that, so when I visited uh, a um, center in, in Nanjing, they were training five um, interventional neurology fellows in one year. And they have all of them scrubbing in, and they you know, do the cases, sort of every case with three or four fellows, and then everybody kind of learns. And so this is a um, really uh, uh, you know, unusual problem where we have so much demand and, and such less uh, practitioners who do this. So uh, from a company standpoint, how, how do you see uh, training uh, uh, you know, as a, a, a factor? How, like, these practitioners are going to use your device, they have to use it well. What's your, now it's been two or three years of seeing how China is doing it. Are there thoughts around training and, and how, how uh, good training uh, can, can, can uh, occur and, and help our patients? Yeah, absolutely, and that is a very valid point because as, you know, um, we train more and more interventionalists to meet the demand, the rigor of training and the, uh, you know, and the credibility of the training becomes extremely important. During uh, WFITN, we, we, you know, prior to the start of the meeting, we had a 13 society and SVIN was one of the participating members. Uh, and the industry meeting where we discussed at length certification requirements and what the appropriate training standards need to be and if we can actually have a harmonized training standard specifically for ischemic stroke across the globe. Um, you know, there were some thoughts and, and, and that came out of that and I think you'll see that, you know, published sometime soon. The, uh, it, 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 is, it is important to have some kind of a standard and there are some standards that are already established in China. The, the challenge is, uh, you know, it probably will differ with each different country depending on the critical mass that they already have or if they don't, you know, or, or not having a critical mass. So I think societies play an important role in being able to enforce that requirement. Industry's role also becomes important here because that continued uh, refinement of skills and that training, you know, there is a burden that we also carry and a responsibility that we have. Um, now, in a place like China, where, you know, we have now hundreds of newly trained interventionalists who are doing stroke treatment, you know, even we have to keep up pace with that demand to be, to be able to offer that kind of training. But nothing supplements that hands-on training that they get. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think, um, you know, uh, I, I know firsthand through a lot of different, you know, uh, my interactions with a lot of uh, physicians in China and other countries, they would love to get you know, the brain trust from a society like SVIN, where they can actually have some level of standardization and endorsement by a society like SVIN for the training that they're doing now. Because right now they're, you know, they're training to the best of the knowledge that they know. But if they can get some kind of an international guideline or a standard that is established, I think that'll help them go a long way. Jack, any Excellent, we'll open it to the audience. Uh, we're going to ask two more questions and then open it to the audience. Uh, you, I think you have to come to the mic because this session does not exist officially in the app. Well, while uh, audience speakers are uh, coming up, I have a question to um, all, all three of our uh, leaders here. Um, what one or two products in your company um, do you think is a game changer that is perhaps underutilized, like you would like to see more utilized in the field? Maybe we'll start with Dr. Guillaume. Um, well, on the ischemic side, um, uh, of course, the Sophia catheter was probably the first very navigable ca catheter to, to be utilized for, um, for aspiration. Um, I think it's utilized a lot, and um, competitors have really come up with very comparable products uh, from what I can tell when I speak to colleagues when I go in the field. 
Um, in the um, hemorrhagic uh, side, uh, web for sure um, is uh, is going to be um, sort of a game changer in terms of a conceptual change in how we treat aneurysms uh, without having to deal with uh, the parent vessel, and and we're seeing really rapid increased adoption throughout the world. So in terms of those two products that. Those would be probably the, the major uh, achievements that uh, we've had at Microvention. Um, so I, I'd say, you know, you, you, you asked for game changers, so I'd say solitaire. And, you know, underutilized only because I think the of market access issues, it, you know, outside of the United States and so on, including the U.S. too. The uh, second product that comes to my mind would be the pipeline shield device. It is the flow diverter that, is, that has a surface modification of phosphorylcholine. It is available um, almost around uh, in uh, every country around the world with the exception of the United States. And we are working with the FDA in being able to bring that technology. We know that it you know, reduces the material thrombogenicity part of, uh, of flow diversion, and you know, thrombogenic complications are one of the main things, drivers or safety concerns with the flow diverters. And so this helps alleviate that a little bit from the material side. So we are, we are engaged with the FDA quite a bit and uh, we are hoping we can get it to the U.S. pretty soon. I really feel like it's hard for us to describe as industry what's a game changer versus not. I really feel like that comes from the physicians and from those who are using the products to really tell us which ones were the game changing products. I think what we hear from people is that what we did with the Penumbra system and all the iterations that we've had since, um, and that belief and that incredible belief and aspiration as a first line as a first line approach from both a health economics as well as an ease of use perspective, um, has really been a game changer not just in the United States but in many countries around the world, and we're we're happy to see that so many others are seeing the benefits of aspiration and. And, and it's a wonderful compliment to the work that we've done over the last 15 years. Um, on the underutilized side of things, I think um, our large volume coils, I think would be an area where we don't talk a lot about coils, right? I think we all have coils in our portfolio. Coils are one of those things. We've got great technologies like web and pipeline, um, but having something along those lines that can, that can do something a little bit different um, and solve a unique potentially like a very niche niche kind of like application is something that I think we can do more of, right? And we can bring to more patients, but we still got a lot to do with stroke. We still got a lot to do with all sorts of technologies. We're really proud of what we've done um, and really thankful for the support of so many of those of you in the room who have helped us with those efforts along the way. And we thank you for championing these products into our, our workforce. Um, no audience members yet. So I'm going to ask uh, possibly a slightly sensitive question to industry. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things that get discussed a lot, not just with stroke devices, but with every therapy that comes out is cost. And, and I think the um, uh, sort of the concepts around how cost can be managed for, for society is, is a big question. But in terms of stroke devices, it, it uh, I think is uh, very pertinent because of how much burden there is. Uh, and so in, in discussions, it's, it's not clear to me when we have personal discussions where, how the industry uh, aims to solve this cost issue, at least in the short term. Because access, at, at, till patients and, and society see a device and its effectiveness, uh, the, the, the adoption is, is very slow. So how does industry think about cost and, and possibility of you know, reducing cost? What, what, what feasibility do you guys have in doing that? I'm afraid you're out of my uh, sphere of expertise within the company here. So I'm going to pass on that for fear of putting my foot in my mouth. I can certainly talk to cost, right, um, from my perspective. Um, and for, certainly from a penumbra perspective, cost has been something we've thought about for a long time. Hence, we were very excited to see the results of Compass, 
that showed with the aspiration first technique being half the cost even just in the United States um, versus a stent retriever first approach with adjunctive devices. That, that is true to who we are. That's true to the message that we have had um, and how we started in all this, in, in this entire space in terms of wanting to help stroke patients. Um, that continues as we go into each market. I think all of us can speak to the fact that, and this is what's a bit confusing about healthcare around the world, is that every country has a different set of um, reimbursement, right? There's different, how patients pay for those procedures is very different, and I think we all as different, different industry members are very conscious of that and looking at how can we ensure that patients have access to treatment and at the same time we're able to support the training activity, the R&D activity, all of those things so we can help more and more patients. And so it's a balance that I think we all work through and I think we're, I would say all of us are very committed overall to ensuring that there's a cost effective solution for patients. I'd agree with that. So affordability of, uh, of care is something that, you know, as industry partners, we think about constant because it is, you know, it's uh, it, the, the act market access uh, of technology it is intimately tied to the affordability of the healthcare itself, which is, by the way, a, a, a larger problem as a society that we face, affordability of healthcare. Um, now, there are a few levers that actually will uh, you know, make it more affordable and, ado and therefore adoptable. And we have seen this in, in other fields also. Cardio, you know, the interventional cardiology is a great example. You know, when, uh, you know, the uh, cardiovascular stents came out, the price was completely different than what it is now 15, 10, 15 years down the road. And, and I think that is very true of any technology that comes out, you know, just like the uh, affordability of an Apple phone today versus, you know, what the model was a few years ago. Uh, and, and there is no doubt that, you know, you know, from an economic standpoint, that we'll also in the neurovascular space follow the same paradigm. And, you know, the, there are two main levers that come to at least my mind when I think about affordability. Number one is innovation. As, you know, we continue to keep innovating, that also, uh, you know, the cost is one of the drivers for innovation. And so, you know, it'll help us get there. And the second is obviously government policy and reimbursement within the regions. We're also seeing more and more, uh, you know, healthcare purchasing groups and hospitals have the ability because of the consolidation and the M&A activity happening in that realm, also having, you know, flexing their muscle, if you will, and coming up with, you know, creative ways to make uh, technology more affordable. And I think that'll continue to, you know, continue to go in that direction too. So um, it'll happen. It is going to, you know, be that natural evolution for any technology that it has to go through. So costs are going to come down. They'll have to, I think. There's no option. <laughs> As we wrap this session up, um, <clears throat> since the audience are not coming up, I'd like to ask a question from all of you. On behalf of the young, excited investigators, uh, scientists, um, and all the people that would like to reach the industry and want to know if they come up with the idea of a device, uh, if they come up with an idea for a research project, what are the processes? What would you recommend for them? And is there advice that you can give them uh, that would make it easier to have that collaboration between the physicians and the industry? So, go ahead. So I can go uh, uh, first on that one. If you have an idea that you think is going to be a device or a technology or even a biologic or a drug, First, go see a patent lawyer before you come and talk to industry, just so that that, you know, is very clear in terms of protecting your IP and, you know, uh, having any kind of confusion between where that, uh, who has the rights on that IP. Most of the time, at least the, you know, strategic partners that you will be working with, if you have an idea, that will be the first question we will ask. Have you, have, do you have IP protection or have you at least seen an IP lawyer? Um, now, if it, when it comes to research, you know, you can reach out to, uh, most typically it is the uh, R&D or the medical affairs groups within industry that handle research ideas and research proposals. Your, your rep should be able to guide you in the right direction and, and then they step away from the whole process. Um, and there are a couple of different ways you can get involved with research, industry-sponsored trials, IDE trials, you know, registries and so on. Uh, these industry partners actively seek 
sites for participation. You could, you know, get on some of those trials and either as a PI from your center or as a co-PI. Uh, and then there are ideas that you would have that you want research funding for. And that becomes a straight application that you do to the company seeking funding. And very typically, you know, the, uh, on the industry side, you will work with a group of individuals who have advanced degrees, MDs, PhDs, and so on, who are very familiar with the NIH review process for grants and applications, and you'll, it'll go through a similar kind of a process, too. So, sorry, Deepa. No, I would say um, come talk to us, yeah. right, would be the simplest way of saying that, right? I think your advice about a patent attorney is very important, right? Protect your, protect your idea. Um, but if it's something that you have a question, if you're not sure yet, right, don't hesitate, I think, to ask any of us those questions. Um, you can connect through your rep. I think that's a great way of doing that. They'll find the right person in each organization because it's probably a little different in Medtronic than it is in Microvention than it is in Penumbra. But come talk to us, right? We would love to hear those ideas and those concepts, and we welcome them. Same thing. We have uh, at Microvention, it's going to be myself, there's Rob Green, a number of uh, people that you've all seen uh, associated with the Microvention company. Uh, we're extremely uh, open and interested uh, in talking with anybody who has an idea for device research, uh, clinical protocols. Um, we have a grant process in place uh, for uh, research uh, as well. Um, for device development, um, I know if some of you were in Naples at the World Federation, I was asked to give a, a lecture in, in the scope of a session that was sort of interesting called uh, Bring Devices to, uh, to Market. Uh, there was a regulatory perspective, industry perspective, physician's perspective. So um, I gave the physician's, the uh, regulatory, what am I saying, the company's perspective. Um, and I think it's important for our physicians to understand how that process goes. Uh, I won't get into the details here, but I can tell you that I've learned in the last two and a half years that this process is a lot more complicated, lengthy, and expensive than uh, I realized, and I think most of you realize as well. So when you do have an idea, um, have it candidly, uh, protect yourselves like everybody else said, and uh, approach any of us within our company or others uh, with um, uh, maybe uh, a, a grain of, of patience. Um, companies are, um, are not public entities. They're, they're not charity entities. Uh, and so uh, when you get into uh, device development, just to give you a very quick example, the web took about 10 to 12 years and about $100 million from idea to FDA approval. So um, there's all, all kinds of things that need to be considered when you're uh, having an idea for a device, including the fact that maybe the device is going to be obsolete by the time it comes out 10 or 12 years later. All right. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Let's move on to our next session. And thanks, thank, you. Uh, thank you to the industry um, leadership to come here and share their ideas with us.